Previously on Brandon's Cult Movie Reviews. Brandon talked about the first hour or so of Life Force while making some jokes. That's pretty much it. In fact, you know what? I don't even know why he's bothering to have a previously on segment. This isn't like it's a TV show where you have to fill people in in case they missed the last episode. This is the internet. Just tell people to watch your last video. I'm assuming it's still up. That is, unless, of course, it got flagged because you forgot to black box some nudity like an idiot. All right, all right, fine, shut up. By the way, when are you going to review another Godzilla movie? I said shut up! Jesus, some people. So when we last left off, we learned that Carlson had a connection with the space girl and that she was now sharing a body with another woman. And if you need any more filled in, just go watch part one. Assuming, of course, MGM hasn't blocked it. If that wasn't bad enough, the alien spaceship's getting closer to Earth. How can things possibly get any worse? Dr. Falada? Oh shit, turns out space vampires aren't that easy to kill. Who knew? So any luck finding where the space girl is? The girl he picked up was a nurse named Ellen, but he dropped her off at Thurston Hospital after spending the afternoon with her. Isn't that an asylum of some sort? Yes, for the criminally insane. Well, hey, they had to write the script for this somewhere. They make their way to the asylum and meet the hospital director played by, hey, Patrick Stewart. This movie's enunciation just went through the roof, and it was already pretty good. He takes him to the nurse's quarters. Hopefully these two don't figure out that this is really a school for mutants. And I knew it! It was David Bowie behind everything the whole time! Seriously, look at him and tell me he didn't look like a space vampire. To find out about the space girl, Carlson is gonna need to be subtle. Tell me. No! Or not. It's gone from her. It's in another body now. Oh, sorry. Turns out I didn't need to slap you. My bad. So, uh, why are you still hurting her? Despite appearances, this woman is a masochist. An extreme masochist. She wants me to force the name out of her. Wait, so he can tell somebody's sexual kinks just by looking at him? Boy, hopefully Steve Railsback never looks into my eyes. And does Carlson have to get all the chicks in this movie? Yep, all in a day's work for Steve. There's a look that says, she just got rails backed. So having found out which person the space girls jumped into, Carlson asked the warden to take them to him. But are they sure Patrick Stewart isn't a vampire? Seriously, it's been 30 years and the guy looks practically the same. Come to think of it, I think Matilda May might be a vampire in real life too. He takes them to an inmate that they prepare to tranquilize so the space girl can't escape, but psych, she's actually in Patrick Stewart. <laughs> No, Steve Railsback riding Patrick Stewart while he flops around like a trout is hilarious. Oh, that's why they tranquilized him. It was to help him prepare for his role as Professor X. You don't know what we're dealing with here. If he slips out from under, she'll escape. So that just means Matilda May will be back. That doesn't sound so bad to me. Things are really getting serious. The camera angles have gone all Battlefield Earth on us. God damn it! All right, enough screwing around. Time to see if the space girl's in there. Now you talk to me. Carlson, be with me. I love you. Damn, and you thought Patrick Stewart had a sexy voice before. Why are you so human? So perfect. Our bodies are unimportant. I took my shape from your mind. As an aside, the Ghostbusters really should have thought of Matilda May instead of the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man. And this leads to what is easily one of the greatest scenes in sci-fi movie history. Tom demands to know what his connection to the space girl is, and then this happens. Don't you need Carlson? Let me go! Let me go! Oh. Let me go! Please, I don't want to make out with Patrick Stewart! No! Fun fact, Patrick Stewart is on record as saying that this was his first on-screen kiss. That's right, Patrick Stewart, a Shakespeare-trained actor, got his first movie kiss making out with Steve Railsback. Oh 
Oh crap, Toby Hooper had some leftover effects from Poltergeist in there! Okay, I want to make a small correction to my previous video. Now Tom just nutted harder than any man has before. We learned that the Space Girl was actually distracting Carlson and Kane this whole time and deliberately leading them away from London. Is it possible we didn't find all of her victims? Thing would spread. In a chain reaction, geometrically, until by now. You know what? This is actually a really interesting plot point. There's plenty of zombie movies that show the plague spreading exponentially, but you rarely see that with vampires, even though if you think about it, they should both work the same way. If a vampire bites somebody and turns them into a vampire, and then that person bites somebody else, it wouldn't be long before the population got overwhelmed. And one of the only movies to actually use this as an important plot point? Life Force. They better hurry up and get back to London. They gotta get Patrick Stewart to his Star Trek The Next Generation audition. First, though, they get some important info from Dr. Falada. The two men didn't die, but I killed one of them. A leaded metal shaft penetrating not through the heart, but through the energy center two inches below the heart. Well, duh. Don't you know anything about vampires? And that was a lucky guess. Good thing the vampire's weak spot isn't in their armpit or something. But as weird as that is, that's nothing compared to what happens next. Just... Just watch. What the fuck? All right, so that happens. Patrick Stewart and another man just had all the blood leave their body and reform into Matilda May, who then disintegrated. Say what you want about this movie, but you are not going to see that shit anywhere else. And I get the feeling Tom hasn't been entirely truthful until now. I opened her serial animation case. Either I did it, or she did it. I was in love on a level you've never known, Kane. No need to apologize, Tom, because again, I fucking get it. After all, when sparks fly between two people, you can't help it. Carlson, she's not human. She's not a woman. She'll destroy you. She's destroyed worlds. Well, sure, but the makeup sex is amazing. They make their way back to London, where it looks like the friggin' apocalypse is happening. Either that or Walter Peck opened the containment unit that was located in London. Carlson and Kane go to the Prime Minister's office, but something tells me he isn't gonna be much help. Here, for a moment. I'll be back, gentlemen, I'll be back. Miss Hammerson. Miss <laughs> Typical politician, always in the pocket of big space vampire. They may have lost the Prime Minister, but at least they still have Henry Mancini's awesome musical score. Ah, the apocalypse has never seemed so uplifting. They make their way to a NATO army base. Hopefully they know how to handle the situation. We have totally isolated London in order to stop further contagion. If that fails, and the surrounding areas are threatened... Then we'll have no choice but to go full Return of the Living Dead on their ass. Sterilization by thermonuclear device has been approved. Oh, shit, that is what they're talking about. They better decide what they're gonna do quick. The spaceship's directly over London, and I think it's about to bloom. All those little blue lights going up toward the clouds. They're human souls. How does Tom know all this? Is he like a kid in a Gamera movie or something? One thing's for sure, there is something strange in the neighborhood. I'm not joking, there's something weird and it don't look good. Where is she, Carlson? She's drawing me, Kane. Carlson. I've gotta go. Why? Come on, isn't it obvious? She's hot. When they take on a new life form, they have to learn from that life form. 
mate with it in a sense. Well, you heard me. Gotta go mate with the space girl to save humanity. Man's gotta do what a man's gotta do. I don't make the rules. Admittedly, the next part of the movie's a little rushed. Tom abruptly leaves to find the space girl and Kane goes off after him. One bright side to a zombie vampire apocalypse, you get to play Grand Theft Auto in real life. You know, I can't accuse this movie of not being ambitious, since they really pulled out all the stops, making it look like London was on fire and overrun by zombies. With a lot of big budget flops, you can tell that a lot of the budget went to waste, but here, all that money pretty much looks like it's on screen. Not only that, but it also mixes a surprising amount of different genres. So far we've gone from an alien sci-fi film, to a vampire possession film, an erotic thriller, all the way to a zombie apocalypse film. Throw in some dinosaurs and Turkish superheroes and it could almost be a microcosm for my whole show. Which I actually wouldn't mind seeing now that I think about it. Hello and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. And today we're talking about yet another Mr. T comic. I mean, let's face it, you can always talk about Mr. T and never find anything wrong to say about it because Mr. T. So today we need to discuss the intricacies of the- Uh, excuse me, what are you doing? Oh, I'm sorry, I thought your viewers could use a break from this crazy ass movie with something slightly less crazy ass. Well, actually, no. As weird and all over the place as this movie is, there's a real imagination and energy to it that's actually really enjoyable. Wait a minute, are you saying you actually like this movie? Well, yeah, actually I am. Huh. Okay, uh, while I'm here, do you need any I am a man jokes? No, I think I'm good. Alright then, later. Carlson makes his way to the space girl, and fortunately for him, these zombies can't run, mainly because it looks like they're too busy taking a nap. Meanwhile, Kane goes to European Space Headquarters, and looks like he got there just in time to see that this guy's dead. You're looking for Carlson. Has he been here? Perhaps he misled you. What do you know about it? I've been doing some more work. You know, the quiet, understated nature of the dialogue between these two, combined with the apocalyptic landscape outside, actually makes for a very moody, uneasy scene. But oh, wait a second, the movie didn't make money at the box office, so guess it's a piece of shit! And here's a surprise, turns out the guy obsessed with death is kind of a creepy fuck. He even looks happy when Kane shoots him. Here I go. Well, Dr. Falada did say he wanted to die while getting his back blown out. Kane takes the sword to go find the space girl, but first he needs to fight his way through a George Romero movie. Meanwhile, Carlson finds the space girl, and hey look, she went clothes shopping. Come. Be with me. Don't do it, Carlson! The world's depending on you! Actually, you know what? You're never gonna do any better than her, and now that we know we're not alone in the universe, how important is Earth really in the grand scheme of things? Go for it, dude. And here's what a badass Kane is. The guy makes his way across post-apocalyptic London on foot in practically no time. Zombie holocaust? No problem. This guy doesn't give a fuck. And come on, how am I possibly supposed to get into this unless the zombies are all CGI instead of real people? But you know what? I think I do know one thing that can make this scene better. Hey, don't blame me for all the Ghostbusters references. After all, the male space vampire does look a lot like Gozer. It'll be much less terrifying if you just come to me. Mm, I think I'd rather come to Matilda May, thank you. Alright, Kane, will you take care of this asshole, please? <laughs> Oh shit, maybe this thing really does work for Gozer. You think the Nostalgia Critic would mind if I used his Zool motherfucker line here? Kane makes his way inside and sees that Carlson's busy... well, getting busy with the space girl. Why do I feel so close to you? Because you're one of us. You always have been. Are we ever gonna fully explain that? Nope. Okay, just checking. 
Kane hands him the sword, which means the space girl's about to get penetrated another way. Actually, Carlson stabbed himself too, so does that count as a double penetration? And as far as what happens next, I guess this saves the world? The two of them ascend into the spaceship, which then leaves. All the while, Kane's left standing there with a look on his face like, Oh man, I wanted to make out with Matilda May. No fair. Honestly though, I'm okay with not really knowing what happens at the end. The whole movie was a head trip. Makes sense for the ending to be a mindfuck too. Although no one knew it at the time, Life Force was something of a turning point in Toby Hooper's career. The movie was a box office bomb, making only 11.6 million domestically against a $25 million budget, and the reviews at the time were mostly indifferent, with most critics not knowing what to make of the film. This wasn't helped by the fact that in the United States, around 15 minutes were cut for its original theatrical release, making an already chaotic movie downright confusing. Colin Wilson, the author of the novel the movie was based on, was even quoted as saying, John Foles had once told me that the film of the Magus was the worst movie ever made. After seeing Life Force, I sent him a postcard telling him that I had gone one better. Uh, yeah. Having done a hundred episodes, including such movies as Queen Kong, Korean Tron, and Star Crash 2, I think I can safely say that this is so not the worst movie ever made! Not only that, but I also don't understand why this movie doesn't have more of a cult following. It's been said that Canon tried to make B movies on A budgets. Well, I think Life Force epitomizes that better than any other movie. Think about it. A plot about a female space vampire who spends most of her screen time naked sounds like something you'd see in a low-budget drive-in movie. Yet Toby Hooper and Canon actually had the balls to try and make a multi-million dollar blockbuster out of it. Truth is, you rarely see big-budget movies that are as trippy, as sexual, and just plain out there as this is. And there's lots to admire here. The effects are fantastic, the music is memorable, and it has some set pieces that I guarantee you're not going to see anywhere else. The movie still has its flaws, of course. Even in the full-length version, some plot points feel a little rushed, and there are supposedly important characters that just kind of disappear from the movie all of a sudden. The movie also has some campy, ridiculous moments, but if you're watching a movie about naked alien space vampires and don't expect anything to be ridiculous, I think that's on you. And you know what? I would much rather see a filmmaker reach for the stars and not quite make it than just play it safe and trot out the same formulaic crap over and over again. And the people involved with this movie definitely can't be accused of going through the motions here, even if they didn't nail everything 100%. Toby Hooper's two other movies made for Canon were also financial disappointments, with some saying that they were a factor in Canon eventually going under in 1994. Since then, he's mostly been confined to directing schlocky direct-to-video movies, which is a damn shame because both he and this movie deserve better. Hooper and Canon took a real risk with Life Force, and it's too bad it didn't pay off, because more than 30 years on, it remains a fascinating part of his filmography, warts and all. It may have killed Toby Hooper's career, but what a way to go. So there it is, a hundred episodes. I want to say thanks to everyone who helped me make it this far, since without you, I never could have done it. However, uh, when you get to a certain point, you come to realize that nothing lasts forever, and eventually everything has to end. And I figure this is as good a place as any to go out. So as I leave this couch for the very last time, I just want to say thank you, and that's all. Wait a second, what the hell am I saying? I can't quit. I've still got so many movies I need to do. Look, From Beyond, haven't done that. Story of Ricky, haven't done that. Planet of the Dinosaurs, uh... Oh, the baby, forgot I teased that in my Patreon video. I gotta do more anime, I gotta do a black exploitation movie. It Oh shit, I still haven't done Godzilla's Revenge. I should probably get on that. Sigh!
Oh, and of course, congrats on your 100th, man. Great job.